once it comes to this matter of the bed, it wouldn't listen to any other thing. So we need to have compassion on each other and be patient. After all, self-control is the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. We can exercise self-control. Isn't it? Uh -huh. Even on that one. Praise the Lord. I want us to go a little further. He said he gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In this again I saw that the relationship that we see Jesus you know, having with his church which is the measure that God is demanding from a wife I mean from a husband to the wife is a relationship first that as he lays down his life for her he seeks he seeks her excellence so that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word now, I don't know whether I could put it like this. I found that rather than Jesus pointing at our faults, finding fault with our lives, he would rather lay down his life to bring what? A cleansing, a sanctification by the washing of water by the word. Now, if we are looking at how a husband ought to relate with his wife, I want to point out that whereas many, many times husbands are very harsh to their wives, especially when it comes to the areas where they are not, where they seemingly, I use the word seemingly, because when you actually get into you know, relating with the women. You find that even though you think there are many things they are not doing well, the truth of the matter is that they are actually doing things from their best of intentions. Now, take for example, I know several of you. If God has helped you now, praise God. But one of the areas of tension when you are going to church or you are going somewhere is the fact that you are already on the steering blowing the horn and your wife is still moving in between one room to another and trying to put things in. look time 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 what are you doing? You know, you know we are going to go and you are wasting all this time. And to such a point that very many, many times there's a little, there's a rift. And it's like you cannot flow together. We have not known how to wait for each other. But only to discover that when you now enter the car, and you have traveled for about uh, uh, 10 minutes, or so you go to church where you are going to preach, and you now realize that you forgot your handkerchief. Eh? Whom do you quickly call? Eh? And what do you say? What do you say to her? Can I have an handkerchief there? Do, do I have my handkerchief there? And then the wife will say, actually, I know you didn't carry your handkerchief. That was what I went back to the room to pick when you were shouting that I'm delaying you. So here is your handkerchief. Ah, he said thank you. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that many, many things that you that you are you think about, she's the one that actually undertakes all the details. As we are sitting here now, if any of your children at home should make a phone call and say, Dad, 
there is something that uh, they say I should bring in school. I don't know what to do. What do you do? Go and meet your mother. Let's imagine that as you and your wife are here in, in a veterinary resort, if anything happens at home, while you are completely blank, do you know that your wife will take the phone and say, go into the kitchen. You will see the second shelf by the right. Open it. You will see a leather bag. Blue. There are two leather bags. One is green. The other one is blue. In the one that is blue, when you open it, you will see a brown envelope. And in that brown envelope, there is another yellow envelope. <laughs> Am I... <laughs> eh? Now, where does the woman have the mind and the heart to remember such details? That as she's sitting here, she knows where everything is, right in the kitchen. And your boy will run there, do everything as she directed, and the problem will be solved. Do you understand that? So the issues are that some of the things that appears wrong, they are only waiting for washing. They may not be wrong. But how did Jesus sanctify the church? Number one, we saw that he gave himself for her so that he might sanctify, not criticize. Did you understand that now? What Jesus came to do was to do what? Sanctify, not to criticize. It is not pointing at, oh, you didn't do this. Oh, is that how to do this? And you have not done this. That helps a woman at all. If your wife is going to find the release, the constant ministry, the constant labor of helping her to attain her excellence, helping her to come to the best, in fact, the way the Bible said, that he might present it to himself, what? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but I should be holy and without blemish. So ought men, that is, it is like this, that men ought to do what? Love their wives as their own bodies. He <laughs> love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Praise the Lord. While we help others to become better, to become well established, can we be ready to lay down our lives to bring our wives up to their highest potential? They are glorious level. To the point that tomorrow you can sit back and see your wife perform and you are feeling a sense of satisfaction. You are feeling, oh, thank God for this, my wife. Ah, thank God she's doing well. Oh, you can present her to yourself. You yourself can be so excited and say God has done something. But this does not happen by criticism. It only happens by first of all laying down ourselves, laying down our lives, and giving our time, our attention, in order to sanctify her and to cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So ought men ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he that loves his wife the Bible says he has only loved himself. I think it's Mr. Ayani Ola yesterday that said, do yourself a favor. Love your wife. Is that what you said yesterday? That when a man loves his wife, actually he has only loved himself. My own discovery is that whatever you actually have invested in your wife, do you know you have only invested it in yourself and for yourself. Am I right? Eh? 
do you know that instead of keeping away instead of being busy up and down there there's such a point that the kind of things that your wife should have done on your behalf you are struggling to get someone from somewhere to come and assist you simply because we did not do what we ought to do in order to prepare her to make her glorious to make her presentable to make her without any sort thing and without blemish now i would like to suggest before we now leave room for the discussions and questions that we may have i'd like to suggest i'd like to suggest that if any man will see the glory of god in his marriage the standard that god is laying down for us is here so for no man ever yet ate his own flesh but what does he do he nourishes and cherishes it even as christ does the church so we are noting that as we draw this what to do for a wife is to do what is to nourish a wife you did not nourish will not be cherishable eh? the nourishing we are first dealing with uh, may i say that whereas we must nourish them in terms of their physical food and all of that but i think many many wives are malnourished spiritually so many wives don't get something fresh to grow their own lives to make them robust sometimes if a wife is going to get something she has to strain brothers and sisters it's all right for your wife to be struggling with other women in the church to cut something but i like to say that it is unfair if we will give space because you know the truth is that whatever you are preaching your first interpreter is your wife am i right whenever anybody wants to measure whether what you are saying is real the first person they will look at is who is your wife many times we want our wives to perform without making any input into their lives many times we want them to be on top there without nourishing them without making input into their spiritual growth now i found that the correct husband that the holy spirit is pointing to us is the representative of christ in the family is the one that showcases christ to the wife and to the children praise the lord you want to make any contribution to this now or we should take questions all right, so let's have our brother Pofi come and administer the questions. Amen. One thing that has become very obvious is that whether you are just starting or whether you have been in it in for a very long time, we are all students. From the questions that are coming and the reaction, it is obvious that we must remain students of one another. Uh, so from all that has been said, uh, we have some questions here. I'll we'll try to sort them out. Let me see if we can answer some of them. This one is a 2008 question. You promised it, but we never really, uh, you didn't get to answer it. You promised to share on special blanket during Claret 2008. And by the grace of God, this is my third year and you have not discussed the special blanket please sir can you explain the special blanket to help us i think it is very important for us to know it thank you sir wow so it's a question a three-year-old question that is waiting to be answered now let's read ecclesiastes that's where the blanket comes from. Ecclesiastes 
Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 verse 10 verse 11 and 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now we are looking at what is the purpose of God in bringing the husband and the wife together. And in that series, we saw that first, when God brings a man together with his wife, the Bible said the two of them, they are better than one because even their labor will have a better reward. That when you and your wife combine together in the work of ministry, you get better results than when you are laboring alone. We have said that, Abby. Now, number two, we notice that God brought them together uh, to forestall a fall. He said, Woe unto him who falls when he is alone. But if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. We saw that our marital relationship, especially between husband and wife, is to forestall a fall. That when you are married, God doesn't expect you to fall. God expects that even if the devil is setting a trap, the two of you will not fall into that trap at the same time. Isn't it? Now, we saw that a wife must be such that could lift up the, the husband and say, ah, my husband, you are not falling in this matter. Now, to forestall it for Then they thought, we said, for the warm fellowship, we saw that man can feel cold. And so we began to introduce the issue of the blanket that makes a man warm. Eh? And so we're talking about the warmth of fellowship, the warmth of even conjugal relationship. That blanket, that cuddling, that when you are feeling, when you are shivering, your wife provides the warmth of acceptance, the warmth of assurance, the warmth of fellowship, and the warmth of conjugal intimacy that makes a man feel, now I'm at home. Now I am all right. I think we have talked around it left and right today how to make sure that we don't tear that blanket. Praise the Lord. Now, but just before I leave that aspect, you remember that, and we wanted to tell the sisters that time, I'm still telling them now, that uh, even though we have talked about so many things you need to download from your mind, which is good. We understand. Husbands, they will be helping you to download now. But don't forget that they are feeling cold. Eh? Please. He is feeling cold. And what he needs is not ordinary blanket. You remember how David, when he got old, they said he was always feeling cold. And no matter how much blanket they piled on him, he was still feeling cold. Ah! <laughs> Do you remember? Then some wise men said, ah, this kind of cold is not a house heating that will do the job. Of. So they went and got a young lady, a young girl, very, very young. And the Bible said, when they brought the girl to him, what happened to his uh, the cold finished. He said, he began to feel warm from that day. Uh -huh. So, 
husbands they are feeling cold sister can you provide the blanket the lord will help us in the name of jesus christ sometimes sisters also feel cold yeah. yes but they don't show it oh they do yeah. when they ask and say ah, give me your time it's you i need yeah? and uh, you will be married to ministry married to computer married to your car they are feeling cold at home that's what she said so husband they said they also feel cold sometimes <laughs> i thought they don't show their own cold but sometimes when they say we need you at home they may be asking that after the discussion the other side of a blanket can roll the lord will help us in the name of jesus christ please keep your keep the blanket for us thank you sir have i answered the question yes, sir, I think so. thank you sir now how long does it take to disciple a soul that's the first question the other question is can one divorce his wife for confessing she is a witch How long does it take to disciple a soul? Oh. And can one divorce his wife because she has confessed that she's a witch? As far as um, discipleship is concerned, Galatians chapter 2 that we read, verse 2, says she is put, he is put under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. In other words, it is not the disciple nor the discipler that determines how long. It is who? You are not hearing me. He's the father. Do you know that when Peter started following Jesus, he never knew how long it would take. When Elijah, Elisha started following Elijah, he didn't know how long it would take. But it took 14 years. For Peter, it was three and a half years. For Moses, he thought by the time he now settled in Jethro's house, he was married, he was having children. He didn't know it will end any time. He just was living. In fact, the Bible said he was content to dwell with him. But God has the timing in his hands. 40 years later, it was time. So the timing is of the father and we need to wait you don't have to say it must take six months uh, after six weeks of learning discipleship we are finished with discipleship no in fact in our discipleship relationship with jesus it is for life they don't graduate outside i mean graduate from discipleship peter never became any other thing until he died he was a disciple of Christ until he died. But when you talk about tutors, governors, stewards, when until the time appointed by the Father. Sometimes God takes you from one to the other, depending on the need of your life at that time. And sometimes, like Timothy, God may say, this one is staying with Paul for life. The Father has the timing in his hands. And then that uh, your wife is a witch and you want to divorce. I don't know any scripture that says like that. There is no such scripture. Even when the scripture talks about uh, for the sake of fornication, even that one, you will discover that he's talking about fornication, not for the sake of adultery. And fornication takes place only when someone is single. So it's not even saying for the sake of adultery you can divorce. In fact, in Malachi 2, the Bible says, God said, I hate divorce. That's the final. And how will you want to do what God hates? He said, you, you, he said even Moses permits you to put away your wives only because of the hardness of your heart. Otherwise, there is no room for it. If not that your heart is hard. And so if somebody's heart is hard, which heaven will he go? What God demands is forgiveness, no matter the gravity of the offense. Forgiveness. 
except you don't want to go to heaven. Praise the Lord. And do you know that what leads to divorce is unforgiveness. By the time you come to the end of your relationship and say, I don't want again, what you are saying is that even if she changes, even if God forgives her, I'm not ready to forgive her. And do you know that there is no divorce that any day they mention her name or his name that you feel relaxed? Do you know that? Do you know that divorce is a sign of permanent unforgiveness? And if there's somebody that you will not forgive in your lifetime, he said your father in heaven also will not forgive you. Now, so, I want to suggest that as we look at the issue of relationship, uh, the relationship Jesus Christ is having with the church is not because we have not misbehaved, but he keeps forgiving us. Isn't it? To the point that he said, whenever I see the blood, I will pass over you. I wish God helps us to be able to keep looking at one another, looking at each other through the blood, through the forgiveness that we have received. Now, if a woman even came to confess that she's a witch, let's imagine she did so. Number one, I hope you knew that when you married her, you married a wife. Am I right? Aha. What was turning her to a witch is part of what you should have sanctified her from by the washing of water by the word of God. Actually, I feel that when a woman is married to a man, a man of God, the Bible says she is sanctified by the life of her husband. This lack of ability to sanctify her is pointing at a weakness in the husband. To now stand up and divorce her and say, well, I, am, I, I send her away because she's a witch. So that you can marry another that is not a witch. I'm hoping that it is not the woman you want to marry that is actually not the one bewitching your wife from your house. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a personal question, and I believe that the answer you will give to this question will help us ministers here. The question is, how did you invest in your wife that got her to the present state where she is able to stand on her own and is able to teach with confidence? How did you, what did you really do, sir? What did I do to you? <laughs> I thought that's the right question. I mean, that's, that's the way to answer it. So, the question is this. How do you disciple a wife? I think that's the question. How did you invest in your wife for her to come to a point where she can become presentable, glorious in the various things that God may want her to do on your behalf? So please, what did we do to you? Hey. <laughs> you want a testimony. But I hope I don't have time. You won't give me time. <laughs> now, well, just maybe I will cut it short, short, short. Um, we met at the university. And uh, we were in the same fellowship, of course, you know, in those years, we had only one new fellowship on the campus. We run into thousands. And we were in the same, um, what do you call it, activity group. We, we were in the village evangelism group on campus. And by that time, I was just coming into the Lord and growing while he was leading. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
And as we continued growing, in those days, there was real honesty in serving God. All of us that were in the village evangelism group, we could be in the villages for days, going from one village to the other, preaching the gospel. But he being the leader, I must tell you, I grew rapidly from under him. I grew spiritually from under him. So the issue of discipleship, even though we didn't know it as discipleship that time, that was what he was over us. All of us in that group, men and women, he would teach, he would go from room to room, visiting, teaching us, and when we come together again, he would teach before we ever go to the village evangelism. So that was where my growth started. And when we got married also, of course, that again now gave me uh, opportunity to actually know him because we were students. I knew him, but I, I know that you know what I mean. It's when you marry a man that you will really know the man you have married. And our lives together, our sharings together, I knew that I have married a spiritual man. I knew it. And even though I was coming raw, far behind in terms of spiritual growth, he was far ahead. Yet, I knew I, have to, I, I had a challenge of having to run after him in terms of spiritual things. He was far ahead of me. Sometimes I would be panting, I would tell him, please, don't forget that your wife is not as mature as you. And that gave me more room to press on, to grow, to know the Lord much more. Even at home, in terms of character, he was far ahead of me. No matter my misbehavior, sometimes I won't talk to him. And uh, I would say, ah, you don't even consider that uh, you have a wife here. Yeah. But the way you will patiently bear it, it kept convincing me that, Kai, I have met somebody. Again, that pushed me ahead to go on and grow more, grow my character much more than ever before. And when the understanding of discipleship came, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, as I understood the issue of discipleship, it was then I knew that, oh, my submission will not just be um, in terms of a wife to a husband. He is my disciple. He has been. But when we married, I thought, he, well, that's my husband. But my eyes opened that, oh, this is my disciple. So my relationship became much more sober, much more grave. That made me to be able to learn from him. As you see, even though, if he also tells his story, in terms of our oneness, there is not anything we really do without tapping from each other. There is none of the articles I have written. I, can't, I don't have any confidence to print it until he has read through and made an input. So in other words, when you read any article with my name, it's not me alone, no. We did it together. And when you read any of those books, don't ever think he wrote, he wrote it alone. We did it together. But it was as we rub on each other this way that I grew to that point to be able to have such a spiritual input into whatever he does. He had made a lot of input over my life. And I'm confessing it not because he's here. I tell people that in terms of discipling a woman, because as far as Ephesians 5 is concerned, I discovered that that role of the husband over the wife is actually discipleship. When he says, Jesus laid down his life for her, that he might sanctify her by the washing of water by the word, that she will be without blemish. What are we talking about? That means she will be like Jesus. That's discipleship. So I felt, ah, my life, my future, my eternity depends on this thing. I better submit to this discipline. And I found it very helpful. I found it very helpful. I could be naughty sometimes. 
but I have seen a challenge of life that will not, you know, leave me alone to go my own way. I've seen something that could move me ahead and bring me into a challenge of changing to become more and more like Jesus. A, you know, what I could call an audiovisual aid. Apart from reading Bible, I'm seeing Bible life. That's propelled me to grow much more than if I have not seen somebody who is living the life. Thank you very much. Now, you remember that in one of the sessions he said that to be the head, you must really be ahead. He was and still ahead but also willing to what patiently carry her along she was reading the bible well they were reading the bible together but there was the bible life before her his life itself was bible so we can preach powerfully we can teach powerfully but our lives may obstruct the gospel that we are preaching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, this one is a bit harsh. What do you do as a minister when your wife is a havoc, a setback to your ministry? Right? Thank you very much. Can I, let me say that the challenge you think you have in your wife is actually the reason for your marriage. I said the challenge you think you have in your wife is the reason for your marriage. God gives a husband opportunity. I want you to see that it's a great opportunity to be married and when you are married is God giving you opportunity to showcase what Christ has done in your life to another life and do you know the moment you begin to give attention to your wife you may think that she's a setback. You may think that she's a, a problematic person to your ministry. The truth is that you have not taken time to nourish her. If you will realize that your first pulpit is your home. Huh? The first thing is this. If the woman is born again, there's nothing God cannot do in that woman's life. If she is not born again, once upon a time, you are not born again. Am I right? God who worked on your life and brought you to where you are can also do it. But what is it that we need to do? What is it that we need to do? I found that Jesus Christ interceded for his church. He's still doing so till today. Have you? Now, but there's a problem about bringing up a wife and I want to speak about that now bringing up a wife is not the same as bringing up any other church member I don't know how you understand that now now whereas you dress up to come to the pulpit as a man of God you give instruction the church member say thank you man of God thank you man of God but your wife has a part in you. She relates with you not as a benevolence. She relates with you because you are obligated to relate with her. So when you want to help a wife, you are not preaching at her as we preach in church. Do, do you understand that now? One of the challenges that some of us have is when you have quarreled with your wife, you now reach out for the Bible. And you now turn to the Bible and say, the heart 
of man is desperately wicked above all else. Who can know it? Do you know your wife will just say, eh? it's all right. <laughs> Man of God. <laughs> Preach it. Preach it. The heart of man. Is it because we quarrel? That's why now you are reading the Bible to flog me. It's okay. Now, what it means is that even sometimes you cannot even read Bible in the context of a relationship that is already sour. That's where the trouble is. And if you struggle to read Bible or to preach Bible at that time, you will only end up quarreling. You know that sometimes your quiet time has ended up in quarreling. And the reason is because you are operating a different rule. The rule of ministering to church members is a little different from the rule of ministering to a wife. And the first thing is that the wife has to see before she hears. I don't know whether you are getting me. The wife has to do what? See before she hears. Please don't preach patience to your wife until she has seen patience. That's why I told you that marriage is the greatest laboratory where authentic Christian life is groomed and developed. So brother, can I say to you, your wife is not as bad as you have said it. I think it's the reason why you got married to her. Now ask God and say, Father, make me a husband indeed. Can I tell you the word husband? H-U-S Not H-O-R-S-E One is horse The other is husband And the word husband Comes from husbandry And what is husbandry? Husbandry is the that branch of Of agriculture That does what? That tends a wild animal to make it a household pet. Mm. Eh? You know that every household animal has a counterpart in the bush. Am I right? What changes the one in the house from the one in the bush is husbandry, is care. Tending, shepherding. I want to trust God that if we respond to our ministry as the husband, the ministry of the husband is husbandry. If we will do it deliberately over our wives and over our children, by the grace of God, you will see that what you are calling white character that doesn't like to talk to anybody, you will see that it will collapse. And by the grace of God, he who loves his wife actually does what? Loves himself. Let me say, the more you postpone the attention you ought to give to your wife, you are only postponing your time of rest. Don't be too busy going up and down. If I have chance, I will send you back home. There are times we have, together with my wife, withdrawn pastors who are on the pulpit. We say, come and stay with us for one year. We ask the senior clergy or the presiding officers over them, release this man to us for one year. Let him take a leave of absence from public ministry. And it's simply to do what? To make an input into their marriage. And once the, the Lord has blessed them, they bounce back into the ministry and you see that things are happening. For me, to build your wife is an investment that you will eat from all life long. So why don't you do it now? Thank you, sir. Maybe this will be the last question for tonight. 
considering the fact that the word of God that is Jesus reproves us when we are though he loves us unconditionally is it out of place for me to reprove my wife though I love her when she does wrong in order for sanctity and sound relationship to take place did you get that question please answer it all right she said i should let me say that it's not wrong it's not wrong but what makes it wrong sometimes is the atmosphere eh? you know that the bible says speaking the truth to one another in what in love the bible talk about that the law came from moses but grace and truth has come to us in Christ Jesus. One of the things I want to say to you is that for your rebuke or your reproof to land properly on your wife's heart, it must be packaged in the atmosphere of grace. Are you understanding that now? You may want to reprove your wife but when you are doing it in the presence of your children, or when you do it in the presence of your junior brothers, you are reproving your wife, but you are shouting at her as if she's one of the house girls. Are you doing it in the right way? Eh? Do you not remember that she is part of you? If your hand misbehaves, how do you how do you beat your hand? Has anybody been able to beat his hand very well? Let me see. Eh? It's not possible. Because there's something in you, there's a passion in you for yourself. I want to suggest that why it is right, and I know that honest wives don't hate the reproof of their husbands when it comes to with grace when it comes with love i actually think that wives actually appreciate husbands that openly shares with them rather than those that keep the matter inside and it is when something wrong is done you now bounce and say hey i've been wanting to tell you this you are not serious can i say to you that your wife depends so tenderly on your evaluation of her life in your words your words mean so much to your wife more than your money that's why you see when you give your wife money you may think she's looking at your hand do you know where she's looking she's looking at your face because as far as the wife is concerned, she wants to see from what heart am I collecting this money. You understand? So the words that come out of your mouth, she she keeps it. That's why sometimes you will you will remember that a wife is remembering something you said five years ago. Because words are very important to her. And when a husband continues to speak words that condemns, that makes it look as if the wife is not growing at all, you are making her totally hopeless. And she said, I don't know what to do again. And you know, any genuine wife who wants to be a Christian, does not want the admiration, the commendation of external men. You are not hearing me. So when your wife has finished making her air, do you know that the reason why she rushed to the room without covering it <laughs> is for you to do what? To say something. So that's nice. Oh, 
the sisters are saying he is telling the real issue. It's, let them listen to Bragulo now. You see, but many times she has done all of that elaborately. You didn't care. The only thing you are now talking about is, and so you spent two hours making your air. These children have not, uh, so, so what is all of that? You don't know that what you have done is that you have said to her, all that you have done is useless. So she doesn't know what to do. And yet if she goes out, those that have eyes, the girl is, ah, madam, you look so nice. But for her heart, she needed to hear that from her husband, not from somebody outside. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please, husbands, don't be stingy. Please let me tell one brother by your side, don't be stingy. <laughs> don't be stingy with your words. There is something that releases a woman that makes her to do better and majorly words from your mouth. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Uh, I know that we have been enjoying ourselves and particularly these sessions. My prayer for all of us is that these little, little things that we are learning even though we have been married for many years, that we will trust God to appropriate His grace and to put them into practice. Amen? You know, there is something that they said is the fact that if it is well in church and it is not well at home, there is a problem. It has to be well at home so that it will be well in church. And I think the serious problem that we are struggling with is this issue of compartmentalizing our Christianity. Wonderful in church, but we are something else at home. The home is part of our Christian life. Let's live the life of Christ, even at home. May the Lord bless us all. Sir and Ma, we are so grateful. We are truly blessed. All right.